like with the money diagnoses, it's really more about tendencies rather than labeling and prescriptions. I mean, there's so much tied into it. You know, I use acceptance and commitment therapy because a lot of what's happening with the choices around money and the thoughts around money and how difficult things can be is just about how to reduce that stress in the moment or to create pause. Welcome back to the You Need a Counselor podcast. This is a show presented by Heart and Solutions Counseling Agency. We release new episodes every Sunday at 5 p.m. Central and encourage you to batch up that laundry, put away the dishes, plan for the week ahead, or do any other task that might seem daunting while you give our show a listen. You might just be encouraged to call your therapist, connect with this week's guest, or seek out those services you've been considering for a while but haven't made the commitment to yet. If you are in the state of Iowa and are in need of mental or behavioral health counseling, give us a call at 1-800-531-4236. Enjoy the show. Hello, and welcome back to You Need a Counselor podcast. My name is Dr. Julie Johnson. I'm the president and founder here at Heart and Solutions in Iowa. If you're looking for mental health care or behavioral health care services anywhere in Iowa, go ahead and get in touch with us. And I'm Krissa Hunt. I am one of our vice presidents. I am in charge of our behavioral health department with children. And this is our podcast, You Need a Counselor. So we are designed for people curious about counseling, but have barriers keeping them from experiencing the benefits of counseling. Our mission is to share stories about counseling, good, bad, and indifferent, and spread the message that everyone can benefit from mental health and behavioral health counseling services. Our guest today is a return guest. Uh, We love having return guests on the show. I just feel like we get to dig so much deeper and uh, and when we've got a guest that we think, gosh, we could talk forever with you, we definitely invite them back. And it's just so fun to continue that discussion. So our guest today is joining us from California. We've got Mariah Hudler here with us today. And you guys might remember her episode previously where we talked about the four different tendencies when it comes to our financial relationship with money. Um, Mariah is a social worker. She has a social work background. She is a licensed social worker, has a medical social work background uh, and education, but really, really fell in love with financial coaching and financial support and being able to help people to understand and tell their story when it comes to their relationship with money and also to help them understand how our mental health symptomology and diagnoses and challenges impact our financial behaviors and vice versa. Uh, And so welcome back to the show, Mariah. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the invite again. I love it. So last time we talked about your e-guide because in your financial therapy sessions, you tend to work a lot with couples and you also offer pre-marital couples counseling, which I think is so important uh, to have those conversations. So a lot of the information can be found in your e-guide, You, Me, and Money which I always think of you, me, and Dupree, (laughs) but you, me, and money, it always sticks in my head that way. But tell us more about uh, premarital counseling that you provide to these couples. Sure. I, um, I offer premarital financial counseling. It's one of the services that I offer that's, that is my most favorite because couples are coming to me prior to, um, spending time's setting behaviors and patterns related to their money and doing it early on um, in your relationship is so important to really take the time to understand your relationship with money. It also offers you the opportunity to set a relationship for money for the marriage or the long-term relationship. So we look at um, your money stories and understanding better where each of you are coming from. Also, some limiting beliefs that you may have um, in how you spend money, um, save money, where that money should be allocated, um, and then also looking very much at values. So setting values early on in the marriage and how you will spend money is so important um, because 
you can't you can't have everything. So what what will guide you when you have to say no, we want to delay this or yes, this is something really important to us. This is what we would want to spend our money on. So it's important to, you know, also to set communication pathways. So, you know, there it does really it's like a hybrid over marriage therapy. So we're we're definitely talking about how you're communicating about money and how to like how to resolve conflict as well. Can you give um, some examples maybe of like values that people do have in their marriage so that people who are listening maybe can get some ideas of what that means? Sure. So I I see freedom a lot. So that um, freedom is important to them. So it's to be able to make choices um, throughout their marriage and their lives. Um, and this really does come into play with work. If you plan on having children, like who's working, who's not working. So it's already setting the stage for some of these questions um, to be to talk be talked about ahead of time. Um, other ones are generosity. So being able to, and whether that's financially or time, um, being able to set out, you know, ahead of time of how you want that, you know, how you'll be able to fund that and what that will look like for you. Um, some independence, um, a lot family, just family oriented. So getting those things out and it's like, okay, well, how does that directly link to money? Well, you know, if you are building towards, you know, a family, um, you know, you're already setting goals in terms of, okay, we might need to set aside, you know, some money for, you know, preparing for to have a family or we might have to have a higher savings rate, or these are the things we would like to be able to do with, with our children. That could also be, um, you know, spending time with family, extended family. So, you know, what does that look like in terms of going to others' houses, hosting people, um, you know, dinners, those types of things. So, you know, as you're going through the, bud you're, as you're going through your budget, you can kind of identify you know, the way that we were spending money. So if we spend a lot of money on food, um, why are we spending a lot of money on food? Is that, oh, because we host family over quite a bit or family and friends, and those things are important to us. Okay, so maybe that's not an area of the budget we would completely pull back in, um, but, you know, like we might look at a different area um, to maybe we just spend less on cars or something of that nature. That's le That's less important. Yeah, those are good examples because the value of family and the value of independence are, they can be very strong values in the same person, let alone the same couple. Uh, so, and they can be conflicting values in a lot of situations. Uh, and so in that, when we say the word family or we say the word uh, independence is important to me. That can mean two totally different things, uh, even though the couple agrees on that um, that value statement. And uh, it it can, depending on if independence is more in, strongly important to me than the family one or not, uh, even if they are both in our top five or our top three or top two even uh they can they can mean totally different things so it's a great example of uh spending money and being able to say okay well i'm spending money on groceries and these these get-togethers and these parties because of the family value but i also value family in terms of you know our family that we're creating uh and so being able to do both in a creative way and say, well, if we started doing potlucks instead, would that still scratch the itch of, you know, I'm, I need to be doing things for my family. I need to be hosting. I need to be, uh, you know, bringing people together. Would that still fulfill that and also fulfill uh, our, you know, this family that we're creating, our need to save more money every month on our grocery bill, or put that money towards some other need of the families. Um, and so it, when we get back down to why those situations are happening, it makes so much more sense. Uh, but it, it would be very easy for a couple to just say, well, you're, the grocery bill is too high. <laughs> And to leave it at that and go, well, I'm trying to save money when really the bigger 
uh, issue is that need fulfillment, that identity fulfillment of I'm the hostess, right? My my daughter's name is Monica because of the show Friends, right? And and Monica and Friends is I'm always the hostess. <laughs> Right. So she would be an example of somebody who might have that need, who would, you know, spend money on all of these things. Whereas Joey doesn't have that need. He's more than happy to come over and eat their food. (laughs) So it it makes even though his values, you would say he also values his friends and he also values his family very, very strongly. Um, And maybe you could argue just as strongly as Monica does. It just comes out in different ways. Yeah, I love that example, like pulling that into (laughs) friends. But yeah, that's exactly it. Like, it's like, how can you still achieve filling your cup with that value? But let's look at different ways that you can do that. So maybe it isn't going, you know, to Whole Foods. I don't know, you know, one of the more premier, higher cost ones. Um, Maybe we just need to be a little bit more intentional about how, you know, how we purchase all the food. Um, and where we're purchasing it from. So can we still meet that same need or value, but in a different way? You know, how can we scale this differently? Maybe it's not going to restaurants every week. Maybe it's, you know, yeah, hosting a potluck or, um, you know, hosting yourself and trying to, and trying to figure it out that way. So yeah, it's a great way to, you know, sit down with couples and say, you know, to be transparent with each other about the things that are most important to them. And then also to allow them to, um, you know, creatively figure out how they can achieve that without feeling deprived. And you mentioned to communication pathways and going having those conversations with new couples as well. Can you give some examples of what that means? Sure. Um, well, I, I look at money as a relationship. So as a rela- any type of relationship, it needs to be nurtured. And typically that's through communication. So um, I do talk to couples about first, first starting off, um, depending on where they're at with their money, like let's set up just one hour a week to talk about money. It doesn't necessarily need to be, okay, let's go through the bank account or anything, you know, that could cause like stress or anxiety, but just, you know, we could talk in general about things that you wish that you want to do ahead um, in your lives, the things that are, um, that you enjoy doing right now, maybe listening to a podcast, just, you know, allowing in for different perspectives. Um, Because a lot of the time we don't really think about money. It's just, we have these inherent patterns that we've learned over time and we never like think about bringing awareness to that. And why do I do the things that I do with my money? So, you know, creating space to like have a money date, um, is important. Um, let's see, you know, on a monthly basis, I like to, to tell people like a money date is really important. Um, and that's just to have a macro view of your your finances. So to understand where you're at financially, I love and even for now, these are all things that I practice myself in my own relationship with my husband. So I, it's not that I, you know, am prescribing these things to people and feeling that they they don't have like a benefit and they totally do. For example, when we married, we decided to combine finances. That was going to be something Um, important to us. That was also very scary for both of us. We come from a single parents um, where our moms essentially were the sole providers of the financial, of the finances. So it was to just be, you know, show up into a marriage and say, right, I mean, yeah, let's do this, you know, like, sure, let's, let's spend everything. That was really challenging for us. It took us, you know, time to understand each other, um, because the natural thing was to to not to just protect, and you know, especially being a woman, it was, it was always driven in like you need to have a good job, you need to be able to support yourself. Like these are all things learned from my mom, who you know experienced a lot of anxiety, even though she you know was educated herself, but she knew that at some point she had to make it on her own, so she wanted to pass on those things. So. So one of the things that we did was we started tracking our money um, and through net worth. So net worth is your assets minus your liabilities. 
And then that provides you what your net worth is. So when we combined, we sat down, we created a spreadsheet and we put in everything um, and we married, you know, in our later 30s. So, you know, we came to the <laughs> to the marriage with some assets. So, you know, all the retirement accounts, like checking, you know, all of those things. Um, I think I just finished paying off my student loans. Um, so anyways, um, so we did that and it, it that serves two things. One, you have transparency around what each other's finances and where each person stands. Um, two, if you're, you know, legally getting married, you're going to have to understand each other's accounts and how to access them and what the other person has. Um, you should also, you know, be on the beneficiary for things. I mean, it kind of brings up other stuff so anyways. So, um, so, and then third, you can track it from month to month. And that's what we started doing. And what that helped us, you know, what that brought for us is, that we got to see our net worth grow together, right? And we were understanding, you know, we had goals and we were understanding where the money was going and what it was doing for us. We did have some big goals, like my husband wants to retire in a year. So we had 10 years ahead of us of like, okay, we have to make a lot of decisions around not, you know, having a lot of financial commitments in order to for him to be able to achieve that so that really drove that was a big value for us financial independence but i'll tell you i checked so you know the markets have been a little crazy over the last you know year and i bet causing quite a bit of anxiety even for myself but i checked in the last four years wait in the last six years our net worth quadrupled by four so four times and that is like, I mean, yeah, I took the time to kind of go back over the previous years to really understand like, oh my gosh, like just this pattern of like intention and like oversight and just touching in and having these money dates. Like we were mostly doing month to month, but we moved to quarterly, you know, once we got our patterns down. But I mean, it was mind blowing to me. And, you know, like uh, my husband I mean, it just makes us feel like, wow, we really have control over the finances and we're moving towards our goals. So that's just one example of, you know, a, like a communication pathway. So making it as like, yeah, money is part of our relationship. It's a big part of our relationship. Yeah, it's a it's a great suggestion and idea to have those times kind of preset out uh, to have those conversations, because some of the conversations somebody might have the thought and then not be with their partner at the time. Like you have the thought at work, you have the thought when you're out on a bicycle, you have the thought in the shower and you're not there to have that conversation at that time. Uh, and then it might pop up to you again, but at another time that you're not with your partner. And so being able to say, okay, I'm going to talk to them at the next financial date that we have uh, about this and just find out what they think about it or what they would want to do or if that's something they're into. Um, and I, I love the idea of having it be a date because it can be really fun. Um, I mean, it sounds not fun uh, when we talk about like budgeting and bills and money and stuff like that. But really what the focus can be on is goals and dreaming and uh, saying, okay, what would you want this to look like? And um, I mean, my husband and I have a folder that our, our house is a, is a whole nother story, but we have a folder of like dream house, right? And our dream house would be like, less than a mile from a bike trail and you could ride to it, right? Like it would have sidewalks, like walkability is a huge thing. It would have fruit trees. Like there are all of these things that every time I see something, it would have those windows that are like the big long windows, but they can open down so that it becomes just a screen or the screen can then open down and it becomes just a wall of the outside, right? So yes. when whenever we, like we saw those windows in a bar and I was like, I'm adding that because our dream house would have that. Uh, you know, we stay in an Airbnb and I'm like, okay, I wish we lived here because that was so 
like close and walkable to this, 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 and this, right? So uh, all of these different things, because we have had those conversations, we have a place to put that information when it comes up. Uh, and so then we can review it and continue to keep talking about it. Uh, in the budgeting, we have a we have an app called um, Good Budget. And it's similar to Dave Ramsey's Every Dollar, except it doesn't link to your bank account, which I, I kind of like that, honestly. Um, and I have it on my phone and my partner has it on his phone. And every single time, if I buy gas, if I buy $15 at the grocery store, if I pay a bill. Every single time that money comes out of our account, we put it in there. And that way we know what's in each of our envelopes, you know? And so when I, in real time, know that, okay, this is how much is in our medical envelope, right? Or this is how much is in our cat supplies <laughs> envelope, right? Like we know what's in there at any given time. Uh, and then we don't have to have disagree. He never has to call me and be like, oh, can I buy this, right? And I never have to call him and say like, can I buy this? If there's money in there and it's for that category, I'm buying it, right? And then if there's something that he's like, oh, I was gonna buy this thing this month, whatever, like we know that it refills every paycheck. So then I can know like, okay, we're saving up to this amount in that category so that in three paychecks, he'll have enough and we can buy whatever that thing was that he wanted to do. Um, or if there's a bill in the medical one that we know is there, we're like, okay, <laughs> it's this many paychecks because we know exactly how much per paycheck is going into that envelope. And that's really, it's it's fun because again, it feels like there's control. Um, it feels like I know exactly how much is in there. I know when I will have enough. Uh, to do whatever the thing is, as opposed to just wishing I could do the thing. Um, and because that, that's not a good feeling, but knowing like, okay, but if I put this amount for the next year, I will, I will be able to do the thing and not have to sacrifice the other things um, that are important. So I, I love that, that communication. And th those apps are a great way to just do that communication in real time too, where it's like, it's just in there. Like I might not know that he went to the grocery store today, but if I go to the grocery store, like I see that, oh yeah, he just did, right? So this is how much money I can spend when I'm there. Uh, so yeah, those are great ideas. What are some other things that people can talk about on their financial dates? Um, well, just kind of like what you were saying, goals. Um, and, you know, it's it's the having this money that gives agency. It also brings into reality the things that you're working towards, right? It's like, why are we doing all of this? Like, why are we working? Why are we, um, you know, kind of out there hustling? Why do we take on the things that we do? Um, and having these goals you know, and talking about the goals and, and where we're at um, is important to just feeling good about what you're doing and why you're doing something. So it gives it, you know, it has like a powerful thing to be a powerful agency to that. Um, so the other thing like you can do is like you were saying with your folder and making goals is to create an, a, a collage or a vision board of your goals. So to make them more of a reality and to place it somewhere in the house that um, is visual. So like we are focused on paying off our house. Um, and I got, I pulled something from Etsy. It was like a little house with bricks and each of the bricks is $500. So every time we, you know, make, whether it's a regular payment or an additional payment, we can color it in and it sits in right under where we write down what groceries we need. And, you know, it's like, there's fun aspects to it, but it's also like a, so much domesticity, you know, of like, oh, you know, like here's where all the groceries, you know, we have to write the groceries and then here's where we're paying off the house. So it's a gentle reminder of like, there's an emotional aspect to, to why we're doing the things that we're doing and where we want to get to. Um, so that's a, that's also a fun way to do that. Um, some other things for uh, financial dates. I, I mean, books, 
So there's like so many great books with different views. Like I read just recently, I can't remember who it's by, but Die with Die with Zero. So I mean, it's a strong name, but really what it means is that you know, we're accumulating wealth and then, you know, even with like the money belief, like vigilance, like how do you move to like spending that money when you get to a point where you can either retire or you're in a, a phase where you can help others? Um, and, and this book kind of talks about blessing others while you're alive. So a lot of families are like, I really want to leave something for my children. Well, this book kind of pushes on it, like we're leaving too much for children. Um, the benefit that they would have as adults would to have it sooner. So why not think of a plan to, you know, whether that's spending trips together, renting house, you know, you know, something that is a value of yours that you can pass on to the family while you're alive. Um so, you know, like there's just so many different books with different viewpoints that I think, you know, like listening to an audiobook or or reading a book is also a great thing to do as part of like a financial ongoing money date. I mean, it doesn't always have to be like, oh, let's look at the budgets, like let's, you know, reconcile everything. Um, I mean, literally we've gotten ours down to like five minutes of just like pulling up the accounts, updating the spreadsheet, talking about like what's coming up, like tires and car repairs and you know and then the other is like okay yeah we're doing pretty good or you know like you know our savings rate is really getting us to where we want to be so it just allows for that you know those conversations to happen and I think some to you know it has an overall reduction of anxiety and stress because sometimes with couples some feel more comfortable talking about money than others and if you bring up, I always remember this one um, couple that one of them, as soon as they wake up, gets into the bank account app and just starts scrolling through the app and then starts bringing it up to the other like, hey, why did you spend like X amount on this or whatever? I mean, this is like, you know, like 6.30 a.m. and like <laughs> you're coming at like, and they don't mean it in a negative way, but um, it's just something that that's interesting to them. Whereas the other person that you know, it's kind of activating for them. That sounds like a criticism that, you know, like you're just questioning everything. So, you know, having some containment to that is so important. Be like, why don't we just park this? We could talk about it, you know, at our money day or our next money date. Um, so it gives people an avenue to be like, okay, you know, I don't, I'm not going to be called on the phone to be asked about some you know, something financially. Like, I know we, we're going to have that like Friday evening or Saturday morning or something like that. Yeah, those are good ideas. Um, and so you've talked about like the premarital counseling part of it. Can you kind of talk about like once couples are married, let's say they didn't go through the premarital counseling with money, like what are some tips or advice you have for couples who are established but don't have anything set up to do with their money yet? Um, yes. So if you've been married, it depends. Are finances an issue for you? If 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 they are bringing up things, then I would say definitely reach reach out and get a financial therapist or a counselor to help you with those things. Um, what happens when you know you haven't talked about money is that you create patterns and behaviors that benefit you, but may not benefit the marriage. And then at some point, conflict arises around that because, you know, you, you haven't really talked about your views on things. So I would say, you know, it, money is so tied up in like all aspects of our lives that, I mean, I would encourage you to invest in that you know, in therapy around that to make sure that you're somewhat on the same page. You're, you're never going to be fully on the same page, but each of you should feel good about how you engage with your money. So, I mean, I would say the same type of tips, right? It depends. Like, you know, there's more work for me with my couples that have been together longer. You know, I have couples up to 37 years married who have not talked about money and it's challenging 
I mean, we you have decades of ways that they've created to not engage and communicate about money in their marriage. And it's pushing on them, you know, and they've delayed and they've avoided and, you know, all those typical things. But, you know, it's, he- it's heavy work. It's definitely heavy work. So the sooner that you can do it, the better, obviously. And that reduces overall stress, increases like financial well-being and just well-being in general. Um, but essentially, I start them through the same process of we have to go back to the beginning and figure out, you know, how, what your relationship was with money, even growing up, and then personality, um, you know, all the different things that work through of like, how we engage with our money. And then do you also do individual therapy, money therapy, or financial therapy? How does that differ from uh, relationship money therapy? And Do you ever find where there are relational challenges that come into an individual's session? Yeah, so I definitely do individuals. And uh, I mean, there's always, you know, most of my individuals are attached to a couple. Um, But people want to work personally on their finances. Um, and I've, I've seen this where, which is fine. Um, I, I mean, I like working in a vision. They may be coming to me for say compulsive buying, right? So I have a, a gentleman who um, is really big into to trading cards and really overbought and that impacted their couple, their finances overall. He came and wanted to work on that. And through working on that, it, positively impacted you know the relationship and of course I just support them like yeah well you should be you know checking in and meeting and they initiated that all all on themselves right I didn't need to to treat the couple so but he continues to work on um you know compulsive spending and building intention and pause and identifying what really brings out the compulsion um to make those purchases So it's just a range of different things of where people are at. I mean, I I totally love working with individuals as well um, because it's, again, it's like, what's their story? Where are they at? um, What are the things that they're struggling with? Um, And yeah, you know, it it has that relation. Also like caregiving, family ties. So, um, you know, generational wealth transfer, and then what all the tie, the emotional ties to that money are um, and where they're at in their life today. Um, so there's just a range of things that I see my individuals for, but they, they all have relational ties as well. I know in our first episode that we did with you, you mentioned money disorders like gambling and hoarding and money infidelity and things like that. Um, how might somebody know, like, maybe that's what I'm experiencing or I should reach out for help. Can you kind of dive into those more? Yeah. So, um, in in along the lines of those relationals, like family in, or uh, enabling or enmeshment or denial, workaholism, um, hoarding, it's really not about like self-diagnosis, but tendencies toward that. Um, And I think that those are, you know, things that whether come up individually or within the couple, you you start to recognize these patterns, right? Um, If you have someone with workaholism finds it very difficult to take time off, um, you know, really prioritizes work, may be departed from the family quite a bit, Um, feelings that like there's just really never enough money, we'll just have to continue to work. So um, there, you know, if, if you're identifying with some of those things, I mean, it's important to address those in terms of like finding some type of balance with that, you know, building up you know, what other values that you have, because if you're overly defining yourself through work, you know, you may be at risk for like not being able to stop working. Um, It may impact your relationships. It may impact your um, 
you know, your um, spousal relationship. It could also impact your relationship with your kids. So um, identify, <clears throat> identifying that and then working to build up the other things that you value, um, you know, free time and those types of things is important. Um, like what other enabling. So you might see this um, with kids um, as like we're working towards launching children. There's um, either maybe different views on how, how, what that looks like for the family and that you may be continuing to support them financially. So having a good understanding of, you know, when is a good time to let them be free or let them work through their own finances, you know, car insurance, phone bills, um, typical things that just you've always paid for. Um, and, you know, like when, do, when does that work for the family to like pass that on? Um, financial caregiving also, you know, with parents. Um, so culturally, you know, this could be a big cultural thing of expectations and, you know, how, you know, like planning for it or, you know, how does that affect the relationship if that's not like a, a shared cultural thing. Um, but understanding those expectations and working through like financially, like how that will impact the relationship and how the money, you know, how you have to organize your money to support those things. Yeah, the you've brought up the parent-child dynamic a lot in these examples, and that is such a great point because we do think about money in relationship when it comes to couples because it, it is one of the number one causes of divorce, right? Money, religion, and and children uh, are some of those kind of top contenders uh, for divorce causes. But parent-child dynamics are they start being complicated with money even when that child is in elementary school, um, it starts being complicated because as parents, if you want to teach different financial skills to your child, uh, it means setting some boundaries and some rules and then maintaining those boundaries, but it's your baby. And so, you know, they're so cute and it's hard. Uh, and you don't so want them to suffer. I know. And so when you're at the book fair and you say, okay, you, I will split a book with you. You can get one book at the book fair because they're so overpriced, but it's for the school and it's fun. And so you say, okay, at conference, you can do, we'll do one book and I will split that with you. You bring your money. I'll bring my money. And then they go, bookmarks and they want to get the bookmark. Right. And all of the values come crashing down on you as a parent because I I was standing there at this book fair she's like I want bookmarks I'm like I have a value that I really love that you're excited about books like I I love that you're excited about all things books because I'm excited about all things books right so and also she has dyslexia and so the fact that she's excited about reading I'm like please continue that forever and so that value comes crashing down. But also I'm like, I need to teach you that like you can literally get books for free anywhere <laughs> or like for a dollar. Right. And so paying $24 for one children's book is like, that's hard for me too, right. To say, oh yeah, let's totally just do that. Um, or however much it is for a bookmark or whatever. So then all of these pieces come crashing down and it only gets more challenging. Um, and for those of us in middle age, uh, you know, we we may have that relationships, those relationships that we're navigating with our children, uh, but then also with our parents uh, as adults. And so uh, Die Broke is such a great book. I, I love that book. My dad read that book when I don't even know how old I was, but I love it. I love the concept of it. I love the idea of it. Um, and it's a great book, especially for the hypervigilant <laughs> tendency person, um, which is my dad and I share that a little bit more. Um, and so for that uh, type of tendency person, Die Brock is such a great, a great book for that. Um, but it it also speaks to that parent-child relationship with our adult children. And when I think of 
you know, 30 years into the future and I've got a 37 year old and I'm however old I think about these things and what I would want to do and how I want that to play out. Um, and it's challenging because I, I know how my values would want it to play out. I have no idea who my kid is going to be. And so I have no idea if the things that I would want to do, for example, from the die broke uh, principles, if those things are going to be helpful to her in the way that I would want them to be helpful to her, or if they're going to be harmful to her, uh, if they are enabling a certain type of behavior uh, that is harmful to her or harmful to other people. So it, it makes those things just so difficult. And it's all about the relationship and uh, and the behaviors within that relationship. And so those communication grooves getting started from the beginning um, and those communication grooves being started from the beginning of the marriage uh, or the relationship, so important, but also with our young children so that those communication grooves are there. Like my six, my seven and I, my seven-year-old and I, we talk about money all the time. And I tell her stuff that like, she doesn't need to know at seven, but I do tell her things um, and I'll explain things like she'll be like, what is, you know, this or that? And she'll hear these terms and I'll explain them to her uh, because the fact that we can talk about the bookmarks at the book fair <laughs> at the age of seven means my hope is that it is establishing those communication pathways so that when she's 30 and I'm 61, we can still have those kinds of conversations, even when it becomes more challenging. Because at that time in my life, now we're talking about potential inheritance, right? Now we're talking about a time like I'm not there. That brings death into the situation that brings loss into the conversation. Um, and so having those communication pathways already established before that happens um, just becomes so much more important. So I love that you're saying as soon as you can, like yeah. the best time to start on it was 10 years ago. The second best time to start is today. Um, yeah. And I think that's, that's so important. So die yeah. broke is a great one, I think for hyper vigilant type. Um, and last time you were here, you talked about uh, money worship, money avoidant, and money status uh, tendencies. Are there other financial books or resources that you think kind of pair with each of those uh, tendencies? Good question. Um, I like for money status, uh, The Psychology of Money by Morgan Housel. It's an excellent book. He was a New York Times writer um, that started writing books but he his examples of stories of I, I remember one where I mean there was an extremely wealthy person um, and lived like a complete you know like high status so cars houses like everything and then it was gone you know and then like the basis of it was there wasn't anything under it because they spent everything. And then that dried up and the challenges of, you know, of, of like what, how you define yourself after that. So I thought for, for status, um, the psychology of money, um, money avoidance. I mean, but it's probably for status, so, yeah. For status too, I would say maybe um, the monk who sold his Ferrari is such a great one. Um Real when I think about status too, and as you were you were talking about psychology of money stories, um, the monk who sold his Ferrari is an awesome one, Robin Sharma, and then <laughs> the what that status uh, type reminds me of, and it would be maybe a fun date money date activity. Um, TV shows a lot of them have to do with the status type. So uh, thinking about Schitt's Creek. Um, Schitt's Creek yeah. is like such uh, a great amazing. show. It's an amazing, <laughs> amazing show. Um, and there are so many of the conflicts and storylines and plots, plots of this have to do with having the status tendency. Um, and what I love, and some of it is nature and some of it is nurture. Uh, and as we learn about the characters, especially Moira, uh, we learn about her her money story in the fold in the cheese episode <laughs> um, we learn about her money story and then we go okay the status piece makes sense now 
Um, and the, the fact that she has that status tendency, that's maybe not even her nature. That is her nurture. That is her experience. Bringing that out is something she needed to do to protect herself. And, uh, and so I, shows like that would be Shit's Creek would be awesome for yeah that's um, a great one for a status you know if one person in the relationship does have that status uh piece uh not to try to change that person but just to spark the conversations um about well what if that was us you know and you had this this thought because you had to have that status uh tendency towards money because you had this experience um I think can can really just help us have that uh, empathy for our partner of why they might have that tendency. So Schitt's Creek, I think, would be probably a good one for status. Oh, definitely. Yeah, that's a good one. And just like, yeah, you know, taking those things and looking the through the lens, you know, like putting a money lens on it and just saying like, what what's trying to be conveyed here? You do have this conflict with these characters. You have these different value systems and you know, what's working and what's not working. Um, great fodder for sure. I'm trying to think of another, like, I love the examples that you pull out, like, in, like friends and <laughs> Shit's Creek and like that you can remember and, and draw the parallels for all these things. So, I mean, for status uh, in friends, I'll use friends because we, I feel like most people know friends. So I tend to use friends. Uh, and for status, Rachel Green, when we first see her, and she's like out buying like shoes and stuff, right? And she's like, I don't need an apartment. I don't need a job. I have great boots, boots. That is, for me, like, that feels like a status kind of uh, lens on that situation, right? She doesn't have any income. Her dad cut her off, but she's got a credit card that still works. And she's looking at status. And so that's the joke in the show is that she's so focused on status. But honestly, once we get to know that character and that character changes based on these other relationships, uh, again, she's, she's, she's shown to us with that status tendency. And that maybe is her tendency, but we also can see from watching the show where that came from and also we see her progression um away from that into a more balanced uh situation and in some cases she becomes the voice of reason when monica buys those boots she can't walk in uh and rachel becomes the voice of Re she's still like oh those are amazing right but she's also like take those off <laughs> they are hurting your feet um and so yeah there are so many examples of um i, I mean i'm just, just to give sex in the city line. now too like, mm. you know, and wow, with those ladies too, you know, you have the generational wealth with Charlotte um, and, you know, Carrie was out like basically bootstrapping, mm. um, but very status oriented and always like it, on the the verge of like not having anything, you know? Um, and then, you know, Miranda as well, like definitely more of a money vigilant you know, mm -hmm. person. And, you know, when they bought the house, like with Steve and like the renovations and things. So, yeah, I mean, you can literally look at these, these shows and you're right. Like whether it's nature or nurture, this, the variation, you know, of beliefs and value systems will, sh will show themselves. There's an episode of Friends where Chandler and Monica are getting married. So this is perfect for the, the premarital financial counseling thing, right? And if, if we sent Chandler and Monica to a uh, a premarital financial coach, uh, this could have been some of that conversation. Now, Chandler is kind of like a sillier person. He uses humor for coping, um, but he is hyper vigilant when it does come to his finances, right? He's very responsible. He put away a ton of money, right? And then Monica finds out like, oh my gosh, you're rich, right? Like you've been putting away money all this time. Uh, and he has that hyper vigilance, which I think is so interesting because when you think about the character of Chandler, you maybe wouldn't think that he's hyper vigilant, right? That he's serious about things that he, but when we see this episode and we see like, no, Chandler's always had a good stable job. He's worked that job until he uh, and Man Monica got married, right? So he has always had this good stable job and he's been just systematically putting away money. And 
his reaction when she says, well, let's spend it all on the wedding. And he's like, no, no, this is for our house. This is for our, you know, picket fence and our, our future. Uh, that argument too, that they have over what to do with that wedding money, again, really, uh, Monica is a status person and he's a more hypervigilant tendency. And so you can see that come out in that argument that they have. Um, and I would say that of the friends characters, Phoebe uh, shows herself to be the avoidant one in terms of money, right? She's very avoidant when it comes to money um, in certain ways. Although when she and Monica are caterers, Monica's more avoidant and Phoebe's like, you need to pay us, right? Because we did a job. Uh, but when she gets money from the bank, that's not hers. She's like, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. And she does everything to get rid of it. So it, yeah, very, very cool to think about the different shows yeah. and the different characters. And I'm sorry, are are there other books for like uh, hypervigilant worship or avoidant um, styles or resources? Yeah, I mean, I feel for avoidant, there's probably majority of the financial books are for avoidance. You know, it, there's an aspect of stress and anxiety, financial literacy. So it's really about like, um, what book like really calls to you. And I think that the diversity of books are becoming so much more available that, you know, people that look like me, you know, like are writing books about money and then relating it back to their own childhood and their experiences within their culture. Um, oh, I can't remember what's her uh, There's one book that I just had. And I can't remember her name, but um, I think it's called Money Out Loud. And um, it's great. She's Filipino and she talks about like, you know, their family being first generation and having like TVs in all the rooms. And the way like the way she wrote this book was so relational and funny, even for like, you know, growing up in like, you know, the 80s and stuff and like you, you know, you could kind of re relate across the board. So I would say for avoid it, like there's just a plethora of books, but one of my favorites as like just a general financial literacy book talks about like how to build wealth is JL, Cal JL Collins, um, The Simple Path to Wealth. And I feel like that's like the easy, he is like a C financial planner that wrote this book for his daughter and literally breaks it down in the most simplest of terms of like, you know, like, this is how you save money. And this is what you need to think about. And, you know, these are the different avenues that you have to build your wealth. And it all seems like it's all simple. It's all simplified, because what we get in the, you know, like in the media is just overwhelm. It's like, it's just so overwhelming. It's so confusing. It seems very complex. So I think books, you know, are a great way to kind of cut through that and like, let's just drop a dial it back to like, I'm just a social worker here with some money avoidant tendencies, but you know, like I'd like to be in a different space. Um, and then Ramit Sessi's like, he's pretty funny. I don't know if you've seen his video. Um, I'll teach you to be rich. That's his book. And he's gone on and done like this huge, like coaching thing, but it was really funny, like watching his series on Netflix. Um, <laughs> And where he runs into with couples that have been married for a longer period of time and just like kind of the the blow up of like the couples. And he, he was like, hey, use this journal to like write out things. And I was like, yeah, it's going to be a little bit more involved than this couple sitting down and like writing in a journal. Like, I'm not sure they're going to be able to move through this enough, but this is definitely more the realm of a therapy needs to facilitate <laughs> but it was like yeah so um so yeah there's just I mean there's more and more being offered I think the stigma of money talking about money and just yeah like making it more relationship relational and and fun so you know like with the money diagnoses it's really more about tendencies rather than labeling and prescriptions I mean there's so much tied into it in terms of, you know, I use acceptance and commitment therapy because a lot of what's happening with the choices around money 
and the thoughts around money and how difficult things can be is just about how to reduce that stress in the moment or to create pause or um, to, you know, like work towards these actions, which are very values based. So, you know, like that's the approach that I use. And I, I can use that really across the board, whether you're vigilant or avoidant or money worship or money status. It's really about let's create some awareness and accept like this is and you can, you know, even like on friends, like, you know, there's acceptance of like there's all these different ways that the characters engage with money. Right. And there's just that acceptance. Like there are, you know, like it, I have a lot of couples or people that will call and be like, it just seems like everybody else is doing well with money and I'm not. And so we have this comparison, this tendency towards comparison, whatever it would be at the Jones or whatever. But it's just that we have to accept that we don't truly know everyone's money story and what is behind how they live or how they choose. And some of it is would be uh, like well-being oriented and some of it may not, but we just don't know. So just acceptance around there just going to be variation and diversity um, around money and then working towards, you know, your own values and making choices based on those values is really the best pathway forward because you're going to feel great about it. I mean, I have, you know, couples that struggle because their friends do get generational transfers, wealth transfers from parents and are able to buy houses and things are easier. You know, on the opposite side of that, you know, they what they've built themselves is what they built themselves, you know, so you you can draw value and wealth, you know, that is wealth in itself, right? So it's just how you describe your wealth. Wonderful. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful information. We thank you so much for being here, Mariah. Uh, this is wonderful. I um, I was thinking too about, as you talked about the avoidant tendency and wanting to bring more of that relationship into it. Um, I did think The Alchemist, uh, such a great book, and it reads like a novel, like it reads like a story instead of somebody talking about money. <laughs> um, so that one, awesome. And then The Soul of Money, too, um, talking about money as energy is just, uh, I think, would be great. For, I mean, I think it's great for any any tendency, but um, especially for avoidant tendency, because uh, it's not a financial book. It's a... Um, yeah. And it's about energy <laughs> instead. So um, those those might be kind of nice segues into uh, those conversations too, especially if you're doing a book for a money date. Um, those ones are great too, because they read like a story. So uh, Mariah, thank you so much for being here. This was awesome. Um, if you are interested in doing financial therapy for yourself as an individual or for yourself and your partner or yourself and your parents or yourself and your child, uh, any any kind of combination of relationship, um, definitely go ahead and reach out to Mariah. You can go to Koru, K-O-R-U, financialtherapy.com, uh, or you can go to mariahudler.com uh, to find her resources there. Thank you so much, Chris and Julie. Uh, I'm Mariah Hudler, and I need a counselor. Awesome. And I'm Krista Hunt. And I'm Julie Johnson. And we need a counselor. So do you. Bye. Bye. Thank you for listening to the You Need a Counselor podcast. We are so grateful that you're here. Now, we want to hear from you. Text us or give us a call at 515-650-3231. You can also find and connect with You Need a Counselor on Facebook and Instagram. If you've enjoyed today's show, please take a moment to like, review, or leave a comment, as all of these things help others to find and benefit from the podcast as well. If you're in the state of Iowa and interested in mental health counseling or behavioral health intervention services, give us a call at 800-531-4236. And if you're a provider seeking play therapy CEUs, you can find us on patreon.com slash you need a training. We'll see you for the next episode Sunday at five.